really great to be here. Um, and what I want to share with you about uh, is something about trusting the New Testament. Probably most of you uh, already are convinced of the truthfulness of the New Testament, and some of you may not be. And wherever you are, I hope there's something uh, for you tonight. I also want to introduce uh, at the back, we have Philip Evans just uh, there and his wife Kathleen over there. Uh, uh, Kathleen's got a stall. Philip is our um, uh, US uh, representative and uh, he uh, is uh, someone you want to talk to uh, about uh, Tinder House, what we do, how you can get involved, uh, then it would be great to do that. Now, let's talk about trusting the New Testament. I want us to begin Rather than looking at the New Testament, looking at what some non-Christians wrote about the beginnings of Christianity. My reason for doing that is because if you're not a Christian, and there may be some people who aren't Christians here tonight, you might think, why should I trust what the Christians say about how Christianity began? So what we're going to do is we're going to look at what some non-Christians say about the very first uh, things about Christianity. And here I want to introduce you to someone called Tacitus. Tacitus was a writer who was uh, from the first century, and he lived in Rome. And he writes about what happened in Rome at the great fire of Rome. Nero was the emperor, and in the year 64, Nero um, seems to have set Rome on fire. Oh dear set Rome on fire, and then he blamed the Christians. And so this is what Tacitus says. <coughs> Tacitus writes in a flowery style, a complicated style, uh, but I hope the message will be simple. Neither helped by humans, nor generous gifts from the emperor, nor all the ways of placating or pleasing heaven could stifle the scandal or dispel the belief that the fire had taken place by order, that's by command the command of Nero. Therefore, to scotch the rumour, to take away the rumour, remove the rumour, Nero substituted as culprits, blamed and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty, a class of men loathed and hated for their vices and all the bad things they did, uh, whom the crowd called Christians. Now, of course, he doesn't like Christians, so he says, when he talks about Christians, that they did bad things. But he doesn't name any. He, I guess he would have thought that not worshipping the emperor was a bad thing. He would have thought, um, uh, he would have not liked what the Christians did. So he, here he says that Nero blamed the Christians and that he also punished them with the utmost refinements of cruelty. That is, uh, he, he thinks of special ways of making sure he can really make them suffer pain. And it talks about Christians, and then it talks about Christus. That's Latin for Christ. Christus, the founder of the name. So the word Christian comes from Christus, okay? Had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius. Now, Tiberius was the emperor from the year 14 through to the year 37. And that happened by the sentence of the procurator or governor, Pontius Pilate. Well, Pontius Pilate is someone who is mentioned in all four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as the person responsible for Jesus' death. And here we have that fact is being confirmed in a uh, non-Christian source. And the pernicious superstition, the horrible belief, he says, was checked um, uh, for a moment only to break out once more, more not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital, that's Rome itself, where all things horrible and shameful in the world collect and become fashionable. <laughs> well, there we are. So, what does he confirm? Well, he confirms that Christianity began in Judea, which is, of course, that area surrounding Jerusalem in Israel, and it spread all the way to Rome. That distance is roughly the same as where we are, to Washington, D.C. Okay? Now, we know that Pilate was governor in Judea from the year 26 through to the year 36. And we know the fire took place in the year 64. 
So we can work out how far Christianity spread in about 30 or 35 years. Do you see? You get that sense. And what you have to imagine is imagine Christianity spreading from here to Washington, D.C., in an ancient world in which travel is harder and in which there is some water between you and Washington, D.C., because you can't just go directly from Jerusalem uh, to uh, Rome over land. So all of this points to a picture in which Christianity is spreading very fast and it's difficult to be a Christian. He then continues. First then, the confessed members of the sect were arrested. Those who said, I am a Christian, were arrested. Next, on their disclosures, vast numbers were convicted, not so much on the count of arson, as for hatred of the human race. Well, they say it nowadays, some people, though they don't like Christians, they say Christians must hate people. You know, well, I, I hope Christians really love people. I, I, all sorts of Christians I know have uh, a great love, but uh, that's what they were saying back then. And derision accompanied their end. They were covered with wild beast skins and torn to death by dogs. Or they were fastened on crosses and when daylight failed were burned to serve as lamps by night. So you can see it is pretty tough to be a Christian. Now I want to uh, just uh, point out how this makes it very difficult for Christianity to be made up. Because it means Christianity is spreading very far and very fast in a context in which it's very difficult to be a Christian. That means that some of the key elements of the message need to be there at the very beginning before it spreads. They can't just be made up later on because if you make them up later on you can't explain how Christianity spreads. And also you can't explain how Christians agree on things. If someone after 20 years of Christianity spreading said, oh, I want to make a change to what Christians believe, uh, I'm going to try and change what they believe, then it's going to be very difficult to get everyone across a wide area to agree on that. So that's our first non-Christian writer. Let's go on uh, to another one. That gives you a sense of where Christianity went. The next one is a governor of a bit of Turkey, northwest Turkey, called Bithynia. He's Pliny, and around the year 112, he wrote to the emperor in Rome, to Trajan, to ask his advice on how he should deal with Christians. And he's talking about how he's dealing with Christians, and this is part of a longer letter. You can find his letter all over the internet. It's very easy to find. Just go for Pliny, letters, 1096, and you will find it. Uh, but, you know, Pliny's letter about Christians, and you'll find uh, this up there. So, he's dealing with Christians, and he talks to the emperor and says what he does. Well, I interrogated these people as to whether they were Christians. If they confessed, they admitted it, I interrogated them a second and a third time, threatening punishment. If they persisted, I ordered them to be led off. That means led off to execution. It continues, as for those who denied that they were or ever had been Christians, when they invoked or called on the gods in words given by me and prayed with incense and wine offerings to your statue, which I had ordered to be brought for this very purpose, um, <coughs> along with the images of the gods, and also cursed Christ, which it said that no true Christian could ever be compelled to do, I thought they should be discharged. So you can see how he is a very nice man. Um, uh, uh, he says, I will only kill people if they remain Christians, and I won't kill the ones who uh, give up on the Christian faith. So that's how nice uh, he is. But he has tests for whether someone is a Christian or not. One of the tests is, are they prepared to worship other gods? Are they prepared to worship the emperor? Another of the tests is, are they prepared to curse Christ? And then he adds this fascinating phrase, which it is said that no true Christian can ever be compelled to do. So here, about 80 years after Christianity began, we have a non-Christian writer making a distinction between a Christian in name only and a true Christian. And that is a fascinating and very important <coughs> distinction. <coughs> 
it's important nowadays. There are many people who are called Christians, but then we have to say, who are the true Christians? Well, it was the same back then. Also, his test for whether someone's a Christian is, are they prepared to worship other gods? And that's a simple test based on the fact that, of course, Christianity began from Judaism. Well, how many gods do Jews believe in? One, right? What do we know about what Jews worship? We know that Jews are very keen that they only worship the one God. And so that means Pliny knows he can test whether people are Christians based on whether they worship other gods. If they worship other gods, then they aren't true Christians. Do you see? That's the logic of it. Because Christianity followed, in, um, fo uh, followed Judaism in exactly that regard. You only worship God. That's important. And so even from this non-Christian writing, we can find out a certain amount about what Christians believe. I'll then go on. He talks about a document which denounced some people as Christians and said this. Others named in the document said that they were Christians, but later denied it, saying they'd had, that they had been, but they had ceased three years ago, or many years ago, or even as much as 20. So what's going to follow is a description of a Christian meeting um, by people who had given up being Christians. But if we're in the year 112, and they're describing what happened in Christian meetings 20 years before 112, then they're describing what went on in a first century Christian meeting. And this is what they say. They said that this had been the full extent of their guilt or error. They'd been accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn. And to sing antiphonally, that's one group to another, a song to Christ as to a God. And to bind themselves by an oath, not to some crime, but rather not to commit theft, robbery, or adultery, not to break their trust, and not to refuse to return a pledge when asked to do so. So that's what went on in a Christian meeting. Notice, however, they are singing to Christ as to a God. Now there's no word a in Latin, so when it says a God or God, it could be translated either way. Now this is the thing. You remember on the first slide how the logic of Pliny's persecution was... Christians only worship one being. They won't worship uh, the uh, Roman gods. And here we have them worshipping Christ as God. Now, how, I think there's only one way to explain that. That is that these Christians believe that Christ is the Jewish God. The God of the Hebrews. That's the only way you can explain it. Now, a common way of talking about how people came to view Christ as God, is that it developed gradually over time, perhaps over hundreds of years. And so people like to say, well, people thought Jesus was a very special person. And that gradually over time, their views of him got higher and higher and higher, until they thought that he was almost halfway to God. And then, eventually, that he's God himself. The problem with this is mathematical. Jews can only ever have one God. That means there cannot ever be a time when they have one and a half gods. You see, and you, Christians, likewise, can't have one and a half gods. There's no category of half a god. You see? Because they actually have a different conception of God. You see, for the Greeks, um, or the Romans, uh, a god is a sort of thing you can be, um, and you can have lots of them. It's a sort of quality of existence, if you like. So when you ask the question, how many gods do the Greeks have? How many gods do the Romans have? The answer is, of course, many, and there isn't particularly a limit. So we know the story is Greek. If Zeus wants to look down from the sky and sees a pretty girl and gets together with her, then they can have another half-god as their offspring. So the number of Greek gods and the number of Roman gods, because the Roman gods were rather like the Greek gods with, with different names, the number of gods can keep on going up, and you can add a half-god here and, and there. But that can't happen within Judaism. You can't 
have a half god. In fact, one of the things that's really important within Judaism is the absolute separation uh, and contrast between God and everything else. God made everything. Everything depends on him. And so if you're going to divide up all things, you have a basic dividing line between God and everything else. That's the way it is. And because of that very important dividing line, there isn't really a route whereby over time you can drift across that line. You see, it can't be done. So even just looking at this, what Pliny says, and reading it against the background of what we know about Judaism, it implies a huge amount about Christian belief. We can then go on to what he says. He says, many people of every age, every rank, and of both sexes are being and will be called to trial. Nor is it only cities that are affected, but the disease of this superstition is also reaching villages and farmsteads. It seems possible to check and correct this. It's pretty well agreed that the temples, which had almost become deserted, have now begun to be frequented again. And the sacred rites, which have been neglected for a long time, are recommencing. And the flesh, the meat, for sacrificial rites is being sold, for which, up to now, it was hard to find a purchaser. Notice this. About 80 years after Christianity began, the governor of northwest Turkey is writing to the emperor, saying that so many people in his area had become um, Christians that the temples were almost deserted, and people are not buying sacrificial meat. Now, of course, we could say, well, how reliable is this? Is perhaps um, he's writing and he's trying to um, tarnish the reputation of the previous governor. But that doesn't seem to be going on. And this is a public letter. Pliny wrote 10 books of public letters. These are going out all around the place. It's written to the emperor, but it would have been copied and read widely. It's a very striking thing, isn't it? How far and fast Christianity spread, and obviously how difficult it was to be Christians. And I think that gives you a bit of context for what we know about earliest Christianity. So those are two Roman writers. Tacitus, the first one, about the fire in Rome, and Pliny, the second one. I want to come on uh, to a uh, further source of information, and uh, that gives you where they are. And this is a Jewish writer called Josephus. Now, Josephus was born around the year 37, died roughly the year 100. And he's writing about what happened in the year 62 in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem was his hometown. And he's around 25. So this is not a historian writing about a long time away and uh, you know, a different place. He's actually writing about his own town. This is quite unusual. When we look at ancient records, there aren't that many historians. And you aren't usually lucky to get someone writing about what happened in their own town during their own lifetime. So this is remarkable. But there was a power vacuum, there was no governor, and so the high priest, who's called Ananus, seized power. And this is what he says. He, that's Ananus, assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges, that's the Jewish court, and brought before it the brother of Jesus, who is called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. And when he had made an accusation against them, the breakers of the law, he handed them over to be stoned. So notice this. We have a figure talked about as a brother of Jesus, and his name is James. This is a striking thing because we find in the New Testament that Jesus has a brother called James. Mark chapter 6, verse 3. Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. I've given this talk before. Um, it's, he has siblings. He has a brother. Of course, that word brother can be used of someone who's a half-brother as, as well, uh, but, you know, they certainly have the same mother. And here we have a striking thing, that James, if we read the New Testament, is someone who is a leader in the early church, a leader of the early Christians, and he is dying for his Christian beliefs. 
So we don't just have people a long way away who are dying for their beliefs, but also people very close at hand who know about things, who were, were there at the time when it all began. So when I look at the non-Christian accounts, there aren't that many of them, but they agree with the Christian accounts. Because if I read the book of Acts, that's the fifth book in the New Testament, well, I find that it really agrees. It talks about how far Christianity spread, how fast, how many people became Christians. It also says how much they suffered. So the basic pattern is that it agrees. Now, of course, I can't um, find out everything I want to know about earliest Christianity from non-Christian sources, for the very obvious reason that usually when people write about things, it's because they're already very interested about things. Most things written about golf are by golfers, right? Or golf enthusiasts, that's the way it is. So most things written about earliest Christianity by Christians. I should imagine most things written about Buddhism are by Buddhists. Most things written about Islam are by Muslims. We can't discount them for that reason. Uh, it, it just is in the nature of things. Most things written about football are by people interested in football, and soccer likewise, and, and so on. We could go through uh, so many things. Most things written about law are by lawyers. Yeah. So of course, when we get to earliest Christianity, we're going to have to look at Christian sources. But what we can do is we can say, the broad pattern of what these Christian sources say uh, agrees with what the non-Christian sources say. So where they can be tested, they agree. And also that what the non-Christian sources say gives uh, an environment in which it's going to be hard to make up some of the really core things within Christianity. So what I want to do is look at a few arguments for the reliability of the New Testament, particularly focusing on the four Gospels. Those are the four accounts of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first thing uh, that uh, tells us about their reliability, and I put it, these things are in no particular order, the first thing I want to come to is that the, they were, that the books come from a known time. They were composed at a particular time. How do you know that? Because once you know their author, you have, can date that person's life. Let's start with Matthew's Gospel. Well, Matthew's Gospel uh, has the name Matthew on it, and according to the New Testament, Matthew was a tax collector, a disciple, and an eyewitness. So Matthew is supposed to be an eyewitness. John is supposed to be an eyewitness. Mark and Luke are not supposed to be eyewitnesses. Luke says he checked with eyewitnesses. Mark, I believe, also checked with eyewitnesses. But only Matthew and John are actually claimed to be by eyewitnesses. Now we have people very early on, like Papias, who lived uh, in Turkey, um, saying this book, which I have, this actually goes back to one of the apostles, uh, to Matthew himself. So you have not just the, the claims of, in the manuscripts, but we also have people who are very close to the time <coughs> saying, yes, we know the pedigree of this book, it goes back to this particular person. So there are, there's evidence that it comes from Matthew. And then we can also say, it's interesting that for a tax collector, it talks more about money than any of the other Gospels. Uh, it will talk about the tax men coming to visit Peter and then Jesus, the parable of people being given talents, the parable of uh, how much workers were paid, the parable of, uh, not the parable, but Ju Judas working out the bribe, Judas then returning uh, the uh, bribe for betraying Jesus, uh, then a field being bought with that money, and then finally the bribe to the soldiers. So we find all uh, those were the soldiers who had kept silent um, uh, to, to lie about what had happened to the body of Jesus. Lots and lots of talk about money, and lots of those things you do not find in the other Gospels. So not only do we have people outside uh, confirming that this is by Matthew, when we look at some of the internal evidence, it also seems to be written by that right profile of person. That's just a, a smattering of evidence. Now, of course, if it is written by someone who was a disciple of Jesus, let's say Jesus is age 30 or so when he dies, and the disciple is somewhat younger. Um, that gives you a limit 
to the sort of age range that the disciple can have. The disciple, the book can't be written in the year 120, for instance, if it's written by someone who's a disciple of Jesus. It has to be written really in that first uh, generation. Going on to Mark. Uh, Mark, there's lots of reason to think that Mark's gospel was written by Mark. And one of the best reasons is this, that if it were not for Mark's gospel, Mark would be a nobody. That is, who would, you, who would have heard of Mark if it weren't for uh, Mark's gospel? There's no motive you can um, give for why someone would stick Mark's name on the gospel, because Mark was not famous for anything. In fact, the only thing he was slightly known for was having abandoned Paul, which was not a very good thing to have done, although later on he does seem to have done a little bit better, um, uh, becoming assistant to Peter. The tradition, which goes back again to the early 2nd century, is that he was in fact Peter's interpreter. Now Peter was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, one, in fact, probably the leading <coughs> disciple in many ways. And that while, the, the, the story goes that while um, Peter was in Rome, Mark wrote down all, you know, the things that he could remember. Uh, and so that's really what we have. So Mark has a lot of eyewitness material, even though it's not um, written by an eyewitness itself. And one of the striking things, and we'll look at this in more detail, is actually how we have special Latin words in Mark, which is what we might expect. All of the Gospels, by the way, are written in Greek, but it's got Latin words, which is what you would expect with it coming from Rome. Luke's Gospel. Luke, again, if it weren't for Luke, Luke and the book of Acts, would not be a, a, a particularly known figure. So again, there's no motivation for why someone should stick his name on a, te a text. It's not going to give it more credibility. But there is record of this man who's a companion of Paul, who travels around the Mediterranean on all of Paul's journeys. Not all of them, some of Paul's journeys. And you can work out which ones, because sometimes in the book of Acts, which is like a second volume to Luke, Luke telling you about Jesus, and the book of Acts telling you about the uh, early Christians, um, is he often says, we did this and we did that. Now, the book of Acts also gives some amazingly detailed information about what went on in the different cities of the Mediterranean. Back then, of course, it was very difficult to get information, reliable information, about what was going on in other cities. There were no telecommunications of any kind. Uh, and, and so, if someone can give an accurate description of a city, you have to ask, how can they get the ability to do that? Have they spent time uh, asking lots of people questions about each of their cities? Well, getting descriptions of the island of Malta and of Greece and of Turkey, it, it, it becomes much more difficult the more you think about it. Um, and so the easiest uh, explanation for the details in Acts is that someone really did make the journey described, particularly, by the way, since the wee passages in Acts have more detailed chronology, like we did this after two days and so on, than the bits that aren't wee passages uh, in Acts. Uh, he's described also as a doctor. And he says at the beginning of Luke that he checked with eyewitnesses. He also dedicates the books to someone called Theophilus. So, um, and Theophilus is given the title Most Excellent. Now, Most Excellent is what you say to someone who's of a, quite a high rank. Uh, so there was clearly someone who knew, who was high ranking, and who knew that Luke uh, was writing these things and would not have been impressed had he made things up. <laughs> Finally, we come to uh, John's Gospel, and uh, one of the things we have in John's Gospel is a most amazing um, attestation of its authenticity. There are, um, one of the people who studied with John, the Apostle, was called Polycarp, and he actually became a martyr. He died as an old man for the Christian faith. Someone who studied with Polycarp was called Irenaeus, who became a bishop in France, and also died for the Christian faith. And I'm going to read out uh, uh, something about what Irenaeus uh, said. Irenaeus uh, said this. Remember, he's just two, dis two generations of disciple away from John himself. 
John, the disciple of the Lord, the one who leaned back on his bosom, gave forth his gospel while he was living in Ephesus in Asia. Now, the striking thing about this is that Irenaeus died for his faith, so did Polycarp, but Irenaeus actually writes quite a, a lot about John's gospel, and he quotes words from it, and he says, this thing that I'm quoting from is what John wrote. Now, what's so striking about that is that is far better attestation than you have for almost any book in antiquity. You see, when you think about what Plato wrote, what Aristophanes wrote, what Aristotle wrote, what typically you have with those are some very late manuscripts, and at the top it says Aristotle's Metaphysics, or whatever the name of the book is. You then go to another ancient list of all of the books that Aristotle wrote, and you see, oh yes, he wrote the Metaphysics. Um, this is in the style of Aristotle. It's in a manuscript. Yes, it's an authentic work of Aristotle. That's how people do it. What they don't normally have is someone who's so close to Aristotle, quoting from Aristotle some word and saying, this is by the person himself. You see, that, that's not what goes on. Often it is a sort of inference, and an inference about consistency of style that makes people attribute a work to someone. So John's Gospel is extremely well attested. Now my argument is not that I can prove every one of these Gospels to be written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but that we have more evidence for these being written by the people it says wrote them than we have for all sorts of other ancient literature that people simply don't debate. You see? So if we're going to be consistent, then we would um, accept these. Now, if you accept that the four Gospels were written by two of Jesus' disciples, someone who was a companion of Paul in the years, the 50s and the 60s of the first century, and someone who was a companion of Peter in the 60s before he died, martyred for the Christian faith, then obviously those books are not very, very far removed from the time of the events uh, of Jesus' ministry, let's say in the year 30. We'll come on uh, to that later. Then, let's look at a second argument for the authenticity of these uh, Gospels, and this I call embarrassment and dissimilarity. You could call that two different arguments, but we'll look at this. Uh, let's start with embarrassment. One of the things we find in the Gospels is all sorts of things that would just be very embarrassing. Um, I mean, that's, that's all it is. It's not a complex argument. That if you, you know, unlikely to make up because of that. Um, for instance, hard things that Jesus says. One of the things Jesus is said to have said in Matthew's Gospel is do what the Pharisees say. But we know that the early Christians didn't get on very well with the Pharisees. So why would anyone ever make up that and say, Jesus said it? Or that Jesus died saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I mean, why would you make up such an unglorious saying for your leader to die with? I mean, it's not very smart, is it? You know, I mean, wouldn't you have him say, God, I'm glad you're on my side and I'm a winner even though it looks like I'm not. <laughs> or something. <laughs> or, one of the things he says is there's a Gentile woman that comes up to him and asks for help. He says to the Gentile woman, it's not right to take the bread of the children and throw it to the dogs. That says a Gentile, a non-Jew, is a dog. Okay? Now, what happened in early Christianity is, of course, the very earliest Christians were all Jews. But in a pretty short time, lots and lots of non-Jews, Gentiles, get added to the church. So this isn't a very smart saying to attract Gentiles. <laughs> Why would a very Gentile church make it up? The only way you have a saying like this is if it's made up, not made up, if it comes from very early on. Or, Jesus says one time that they should imitate an unfair steward. Or he says, now my soul is troubled. I could go on. There are lots of them. There's also embarrassing things that are reported. For instance, the disciples 
the leaders are always arguing as to who of them is the greatest. People get angry with James and John. You know, some of the 12 disciples don't like what James and John are doing. Jesus throws tables over. The disciples misunderstand. The disciples all abandon Jesus. And then the chief disciple, the most important one, Peter, denies him thrice. It's pretty odd, isn't it? I mean, why would you make up these sorts of things? And there are many more. Then, in addition to the embarrassment, we can look at the question of dissimilarity. What I mean by this is the things that Jesus is said to have, is said, to have said are different from the way the early church was. One of the things, obvious things, is that Jesus told parables. You know, his stories called parables. Because what we know is that, firstly, rabbis of the time didn't really use parables much. There are about 2,000 parables in total ascribed to all of the rabbis that are ever known. And then you have a ton of parables just said to be by Jesus in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, I struggle to find parables. Maybe there are some in the prophets, maybe there are some in 2 Samuel. In the Apocrypha, there are none. Uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are none. And then in the early church, there are very few parables. The Shepherd of Hermas might be one. That's from the second century. So, if the early church isn't using lots and lots of parables, isn't it rather odd if they made up parables and said Jesus did them, said them? You see, the simplest thing is to say, actually, no, Jesus liked to tell parables. They come from a particular stage. Another example you could have is that one of the things you often get in parables is that Jesus talks about himself as the Son of Man. You know that expression? Now, the early Christians didn't go round calling Jesus the Son of Man. Almost all of the references to Son of Man are with Jesus himself speaking. There are a couple that aren't, like Stephen when he dies and so on. But... Generally, the early Christians called Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. They don't go around calling him, they call him Son of God, they don't go around calling him Son of Man. So what we've got when we've got the teaching of Jesus, is Jesus doesn't teach on all of the really interesting subjects that you would want Jesus to teach on, like how to run a church service. <laughs> what to do, what to do with Gentiles. You know, he doesn't teach on those. And then he teaches all these embarrassing things. Then he teaches using parables that people don't use at that stage. And then he teaches all the time talking about Son of Man. Well, it doesn't take, you know, a rocket scientist to think a simple explanation of this is that they're simply recording the way Jesus spoke. That's my explanation anyway. It's not original to me. <laughs> the next thing I want to look at is the subject of corroboration. This is where we have something said in the New Testament and then confirmed outside. We saw that already with Pontius Pilate, uh, mentioned in all four Gospels as the governor when uh, Jesus was um, uh, condemned. So, let's have a look at an example of this, and this is a subtle form. You remember in the New Testament how there is a man called John the Baptist who comes and preaches before Jesus, then gets arrested by Herod, kept in prison for a while, and then executed. And that one of the things that John the Baptist had done is he had said, uh, it is not lawful for you, Herod, to have your current marital arrangements. And we'll go on to that a bit more. We're going to go to uh, look at what Josephus, a, Ro a Jewish historian, wrote about um, John the Baptist. Now, he says, some of the Jews thought the destruction of Herod's army came from God as a just punishment for what he had done against John, who was called the Baptist, because Herod killed him, though he was a good man, and commanded the Jews to practice virtue, both in respect of righteousness towards one another, and piety towards God. So, the basic story is that Josephus records how Herod killed John the Baptist. Also, he tells us that uh, John the Baptist was a good man, and he asked people to do the right sort of thing. When we know that from the New Testament, 
um, John the Baptist's message was repent, do the right thing, and be baptised. And he, co he continues talking about what John the Baptist's message was. He said that they should do righteousness towards one another and piety towards God and so come to baptism. The baptism would be acceptable to him, that's to God, if they were not using it to put away sins only, but for the purification, uh, but for the purification of the body, when the soul had already been purified beforehand by righteousness. Now that's a bit complex, but the basic idea is this. Get your heart right first, then get washed. That's just the same, by the way, as repent and be baptised. So when we get the summary of um, uh, the message, it's basically the same. He then continues. Now when others came crowding round, for they were very pleased by hearing his words, that's John the Baptist's words, Herod, who feared lest the great influence John had over the people, might incline them to rebellion, so they seemed ready to do whatever he advised, thought it far better to take and, and kill him before any trouble <coughs> came from him, rather than to have regrets if trouble arose, you know, for being too soft. So, through Herod's suspicion, he, that's John the Baptist, was sent as a prisoner to Machaerus, the aforementioned castle, and was killed there. Now, you remember how the passage began? It began with Josephus reporting that Jews thought Herod's army had been destroyed because he had killed John the Baptist. Now, isn't that a bit puzzling? I mean, why would anyone think? Let's, Herod just fought against his neighbor, who was called Aratas. By the way, he's someone who's mentioned in 2 Corinthians. As he's the king of the Nabataeans, just out east of um, Israel. Now, why would anyone think that if Herod loses in a battle and gets his army destroyed, that was because he had uh, killed John the Baptist? Aha! Let's get into some more detail. There are some similarities between the Gospels and Josephus. John the Baptist preaches, gets put in prison, gets executed, it's the same person responsible, and it talks the same uh, kind of thing about his teaching and his message. But there's actually a deeper level of agreement in which the New Testament and Josephus each give us some of the facts, and if we add them together, we get a far fuller picture. Because Josephus tells us that Herod had married and then divorced Phasaelis, the daughter of Aratas, who was the king he'd just been defeated by. So if, you know, someone, you were a king and someone married your daughter and then divorced her, that would be a pretty good reason to go to war, okay? So um, Aratas is not very happy with Herod, right? But why had um, Herod divorced Aratas' daughter because he wanted to marry Herodias, wife of Herod's own brother, Philip. So that's what we get in the New Testament. Uh, sorry, in Josephus. The New Testament tells us this, that John the Baptist condemns the marriage to Herodias um, and then Herod executes John the Baptist. It says, John the Baptist said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. So what we find is there is some sort of sense made out of this. That John the Baptist was critical of that marriage uh, and Aratas was also unhappy with that marriage. And so it makes a lot more sense for people to look at what 